then what you're doing right now is attacking a community for not pandering to you. And that is the fucking problem that you think that everything should be written for you. I'm getting a little fucking mad right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Oh, man. What a day. Welcome to this me going over comments. And I either need to do this a lot more often or um, not do this at all because I am getting really far behind in comments. And apparently it has been two weeks since I've done this. So let's get cracking. So this one is from the Hating Poetry with Matthew Buckley Smith episode of the podcast. And it is from Yon y Yoda. Sorry, Yoda. This edited video has worked for me. I made a comment on when writing scares you. Just wanted to say thank you for replying even though I changed your subject. I will listen to this again with media in mind. Be kind to yourself. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm definitely going to have to go through and um, comment on all of these as once I'm done. Um, this next one is from a video I did a long ass time ago. As you can see, uh, much less gray in the hair and beard. Um, and it was for this book. It's, this is one of those videos that like constantly gets views. It's, it's really weird. It was a review of a book called A Voyage to Octuris by David Lindsay. It's an old, old, um, really mindfuck um, space time travel out of body experience kind of thing. Um, there was some weird shit in there. Um, but this says, I questioned my getting in that kindly old man's car right about the moment he put his pinky finger in me. Wow. Um, to be fair, I don't know what the fuck that's in reference to. It might be something I said, but it also might be something from the book. Um, or just um, TMI from Fortune's Fool. Kep says, sucks, IR IRP, Neely. And that was um, the stream I did on uh, World Poetry Day about um, when I found out that Neely past. And then we're going to have some comments here on the chapbook inventory that I did on World Poetry Day. Someone named Loki or Losi says, uh, I was there to but hide. I don't know what that means and what that is in regards to uh, maybe the Banali or the Lit Fest in Bombay Beach, possibly. Then Julia says on that video, Hey, it's the middle of the night here, and I will come back and watch this later, but I found this inspirational but I found this inspirational videos. I'm a sucker for a good you can do this video. But this one has Charles Bukowski on it, and I thought of you. Um, hope to get some sleep now. Talk to you later and good luck on your Bombay trip. Hope it goes great. Uh, Julia, that's awesome. I'm going to check that video out um, as soon as I'm done here. That sounds like good shit. The Beave says, what's up, Duder? Eliza Williams may interest you. He wrote a bio of Chief, some name I'm not going to know. Uh, and translated the Bible into Iroquois. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, he became an international celebrity in 1853. His former home in Wisconsin is designated as Lost Dauphin Park by the state. He envisioned an Indian empire. Check this dude out. 
wow, that sounds like heavy shit, like a lot of stuff. Um, I will look into that, actually. Uh, Lauren says, waiting for the audio versions of the chat books. Well, because I said my Etsy shop is back up. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you know this. I know I have a um, playlist of my poetry audio books. There's not a ton on there, but there is a few on there. And then there's also extra ones on that same playlist that are in the members thing that's only available for members. So if you haven't checked those out, definitely look into that. And then we got the Beeb and he says, his work is still alive, alive, alive. It's alive. I've never even read him. Check this out, Duder. He made, oh wait, I gotta actually open this up then. He made darkness a secret place. His pavilion about him were dark waters and thick clouds. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire. That is lovely. Um, I don't know exactly what that is about. Um, seems kind of a dark thing to do when um, talking sad over here. Um, get used to the impermanent. Okay. Like always, solid words of advice. Caitlin, this was on the Fixed Writer Self Sabotage collage episode of the podcast. Um, I really like the car analogy. I needed to hear this today. Good. Um, and that, I think that's the whole thing. Like you can't drive a car that's in park. You have to actually put it in drive and be in motion. Um, and I probably went into more detail. Oh wait, no, that might've also been the rear view mirror thing. I don't know. Go back and listen to it. Um, there's a lot of car analogies. Uh, yeah. All in one spot. Say Balm Beach 10 times. I can't say it once. Um, yes, please do more. I don't know what that is in regards to, but I would love to do more. Um, start singing. Life is a highway. Um, not a life coach. Just do art and write shit. I don't know. Some of these points are insightful. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if I said that, but that sounds like something I have said. So, um, it's weird when I just run off my mouth and then people, like, quote me back and I hear the stuff that came out of it. It cracks me up. Um, I totally write poetry on the toilet, as we all do, because we're making art inside the bowl. We might as well write the poetry while we're sitting there. Um, lack of confidence for me just because I've been told too often I'm not good enough. Yeah, and that's just what shitty people tell you to make themselves feel better, or that's what people who care for you tell you to protect you from hurt, even though they don't understand that they're hurting you when they tell you that. Um, I am guilty of feeling discouraged when I struggle to get my books out there. Yeah. And again, it's just the more times you do something, the easier it gets. Uh, I think that's like supposed to be, oh my God, I definitely spend way too much time on YouTube and Instagram. Yeah, stop watching my videos. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Definitely guilty of comparing my success to other writers. Yeah, and that's another thing that we can't do. We are all unique and we all will have our own audience and our own relationship with our readers so um it's really it's really hard to judge ourselves like that hey jim and he was enjoying the inventory stream i did oh say so 1984 is banned where that video um Bookish said, preach, stop watching the news, listen to what politicians are saying and writing. Agreed. 
Um, Marie Morgan says, 100%, the news today is either for the extreme left or right. I have yet to find any news organizations that are moderate. It does not surprise me that Orwell's book is being banned or heavily edited. This is why I do not rely on a Kindle or any other electronic device to replace a book. I buy old and used books in their original unabridged publication. That is a really good point that I never fucking thought about. Because when you have a, for those of you who don't know, if you have an ebook on Kindle, every time somebody um, re uploads that file, the file on your Kindle will change. So that's why one of the things with me when I was publishing heavily on Kindle, like if there was a mistake in the book, I would just change it and re-upload the file and then that mistake would be gone in everyone's copy. So it was kind of like a living, breathing document, you know, like the Constitution that you could add to. Um, but yeah, I didn't even think about it in that sense that things could be changed for nefarious purposes, not just cleaning up bad grammar or spelling. Okay, um, the number of books banned in schools and libraries is truly staggering. LAL, ALA reported that banning was at an all-time high in 2023. That is true. The fact that 1984 is on the list does not surprise me. Read banned books in 2024. Yeah, for sure. And again, um, probably a lot. When this mug was made, my banned book mug. When when this mug was made, it was to show you the books that had been banned, and a lot of these aren't banned anymore. But now that um, we're sitting here in this period, a lot of these books that are on this mug have probably been banned again. Um, that's fucking terrifying. So yeah, guys, read banned books. Yeah, 1984, right there, boom. Look at that. Unbelievable. Okay, so this comment is from my video, Write a Poetry Chapbook in One Hour. And a critical nerd theory says, this is an interesting process. Your videos are definitely helpful. Do you do consulting? I do. So I will leave you a message on that. I just ordered one of your chat books on Etsy. I'm looking forward to reading it. Do you really release a chat book a month? Oh, that's a different question. Yeah, um, I do. And I did a video about that too. Hopefully you saw it and commented on it. Um, that was on how to theme a poetry chat book. Um, great info. I'm going to try to make one. And that was on how to make a chat book part three formatting the book or zine. And then um, he also said, what happened to the fourth part? I need to go back and look because I thought I finished that series. So I don't know what the next part would be. So I'll go back and look. If I didn't finish it, then I'll definitely finish that. Um, I'll, I'll make a note of that here in a minute. Or should I do it now so I don't forget? Hang on a second. God damn it. Okay, so on the Anarchy Crew updates, Anarchy Crew is the best crew. LOL. Sorry to hear you're going through a lot think writing can help you deal with it, especially if you're tired of being emotional. Yeah, writing has helped me through almost everything. Um, gasp, you have a life outside of YouTube? <laughs> Lauren, um, all kidding aside, we all appreciate all that you do for us. Oh, if we submitted a poem and got no response, should we submit it again? Yes. Um, and if you submitted it to Poetic Anarchy Press... A Gmail and didn't get a response, send it to I hate Matt Wall at Gmail. Um, just because sometimes I check different things and then move things in wrong folders. I'm very bad at everything I do. Ooh. Okay, uh, and this is on the 1984 thing. Um, Russia and China wouldn't ban 1984 because it makes the U.S. look bad. They love media that makes us look bad. <laughs> Jeff. Solid fucking point, dude. Solid point. Okay, so now this is on the how to deal with stalkers and other comments. Um, 
So Tempest Miller says, thank you, very insightful, but it confirms a lot of things I've been thinking, which is good. Scary to think about at its most extreme, but hopefully we all dodge it during our careers. Oh yeah, for sure. A great topic to discuss. I don't think I ever thought of it as I'm a small channel. I think it was still helpful even though you were trying not to get into specifics. Good, because that's the whole idea of doing it. So I'm glad. Um, and then Carol, Carol says, um, laughing my ass off. I didn't mean to make you feel shitty. I know you didn't. I was being, I was just being silly. And I came back to add that I have debated a pen name for a while, but then again, I'm a little unknown and don't get much attention online, so I think I'm safe for now anyway. See, this is the whole thing, and this is something that I've argued with people a lot. Everyone starts off as an unknown, okay? Every single person. So if you become known under your name and then decide when you get big enough, oh, you know what? I should use a pen name. And then you go and use a pen name. There's already a record of everything you did under your real name. So at that point, having a pen name will not help you at all. Especially if you're trying to connect the audiences. And if you're not going to connect the audiences, why the fuck were you writing under your real name in the first place anyway? So... If you think you need a pen name, do the pen name, no matter how big you are, because you are only going to get bigger the more you do this, okay? Uh, let's see. Dan Mills, 13 days ago, said, did this just happen? I can't find the clip. Well, it happened 13 days ago, and um, the they're right in the video, and I think I even have like a tag for it, is the... Um, MSNBC uh, conversation about it. So yeah, it, it's in the info cards for that video. When your writing scares you. Uh, Carol says, a lot of this is what my dad interested in true crime, Manson family and Bundy, etc. And then he got me interested in it. More like how the hell can someone be that fucked up type of thing. Yeah, that's what's scary. Um, how to deal with stalkers. And this is with the beeve. Um, the desert is way cool, oh my brother. It's filled with extraordinary life forms which thrive. It's a beautiful place if you know how to live there. All the best, oh my brother. Yeah, the desert is fucking truly amazing like i probably felt more peace living in the desert than i did anywhere else i've ever been but um if you are not ready for those summers um it is grueling um i don't know another way of explaining that like it will fuck you harder and faster than anything. Like, cause you don't really see it coming. You're like, wow, it's really hot. And then it just stays hot. And then it's like, oh shit. And a lot of times from what I've seen, a lot of people like don't realize how the weather has been affecting them until it's not too late, but until they're pretty fucking far gone. So, um, it is beautiful that the nature out there, the wildlife, is some of the most bizarre and interesting shit I have ever seen. Um, especially if you're like in it for a long period of time and you can see like all the stuff, like everything from the fading death beetles to the blister beetles to the desert iguanas to the few geckos I found to the tarantula hawks to the, um, the bats, like everything is just, um, amazing. The vultures, those things are fucking huge. Um, but yeah, so the desert's great. Um, it, you just have to be prepared and be in an area that is like, 
complementary to living. Let's see. NP Hunt, what's up? Haven't watched your chat with Adam yet, but really glad to hear that you guys got along. Adam's a really cool and talented guy. I'd mentioned his forum to you back when you were disillusioned with Facebook poetry groups. There you go. But really glad you guys found each other on um, Instagram. I'll definitely check out that video. Yeah, that was a really good time. And we were talking about um, trying to get together more frequently and doing stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, let's keep that going. Uh, let's see. Uh, Friday member stream and film updates. Spill the tea, Lauren says. Wait, what? People showed up at your house? Oh, so this was on the members only video about a little more detail um, about the stalker stuff. Um, yes, people have shown up at my house. Um, both like my Orange County house, um, apartments I've lived in, um, in Burbank, when I lived in Burbank, when I lived in North Hollywood. Here, I'm trying to think if anyone came into Toluca Lake. I wasn't really there that long. I can't remember. But yeah, no, it it happens. Uh, let's see here. Sounds like you could write a memoir of your life experiences. And then JH says, it's been suggested before, but let's keep suggesting it. Matt's cinematic yet conversational style would be ideal for that. And so much has already practically written itself <laughs> in these videos and streams. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I wouldn't really have to do a whole lot of writing. I would probably just mm -hmm. get the um, text from these videos and just throw that into a chapter of the book. I have a lot of novels, like memoir type novels and um, a lot of poetry collections that are actually finished, they're done. But I just need to format and edit, like just like spell check kind of shit. Um, and I'm really hoping, like, that's why I was talking about taking the train to the East Coast. Just having that time that I'm not distracted with life. That I could just, like, sit there and put all this shit together. Um, send out copies to beta readers. Um, and do that kind of shit. Because with the novels, like, I definitely want people to read through them before they go out. Just to make sure... Um, that there's a coherent story in there. But Horrywood was one that I started, and that was just going to be about my um, filmmaking career. And I would really like to finish that. And then um, the one that I want to start working on now um, that I haven't started writing yet because I don't know what the end is. And maybe that's the ending, not knowing the end. Maybe I need to just be okay with that. We'll see. But this is all shit that I definitely want to do. MySpace, man, you're old. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and MySpace is awesome, so everyone needs to shut the fuck up. Let's see. A uh, fellow author had a P.O. box and said it was inappropriate. Send them stuff. It was Christmas time, and I knew they loved fantasy books. I've cut, I've cut off contact, but was I wrong? I love getting stuff. Yeah, if you love getting stuff and people know that you love getting stuff, that's fine. And if you have a P.O. box, that's the way to go for sure. But if somebody does not want you to send them stuff and you send them stuff anyway, that's inappropriate. Like, if, if someone has made it clear, like, I do not want packages, I do not want um, presents, you know, do not send these things to me, that's like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Um, so, yeah, but good question, though. I thought you were going to share more than you did. Very interesting video. I got a little gun shy. I started talking about stuff and then started sugarcoating it again. But I did give more information in that one than I did in the other one. So, 
you know, there, that's how that is. Um, and then this is on my You Get So Alone at Times It Just Makes Sense, part one of the Bukowski Book Club. And um, Guess Panos, I think. Will there be any more Lovecraft, Lovecraft Horror Stories videos? Probably when I get into reading those again. Um, I'm very much a mood reader. And if I'm not in the mood to read something, I'm not going to read it. So I know I have a lot of Lovecraft videos and I have a lot of like horror story videos and sci-fi videos and Conan videos and Robert E. Howard stuff and Edgar Rice Burroughs stuff. But again, I'm a mood reader. So when those things hit, I'll hit those. When they don't, I'm not going to do it. But um, there should be a lot in there. So hopefully you've... Um, been able to watch a lot of those uh let's see michael says i'm going through this book now and you're right there are times when he seems to be bragging about his success but there are other but there are other poems in there where he says something to the effect that writing is sometimes still hard or about the pain that never goes away i found that interesting in his later years he still struggled sometimes yeah he did he really did uh, let's see, Dan says on that same video, I just like listening to Matt talk about books once a day. <laughs> That's good. Um, I've got my coffee, got a burrito, got Matt Wall on Bukowski. Yeah, this morning doesn't suck. Hope you're doing good, buddy. Um, Dan, that was amazing. Thank you for that. That, that, that made my day. That made me smile. And then on the how to deal with stalkers, MJ says, LOL to that comment of mine. All great tips and reminders to keep personal safety intact. Yes. Um, and then Lockie says, smile, please. I think we've done this before. G give, me, give me more info, Lockie. Let me know. Let me know what else I need to do here. How should I be smiling? The open book says are on the, are you too old to become a writer? I've definitely been a have everything figured out before you start person over the last decade. I'm trying to fix that mentally and put in what I can when I can. So that block doesn't stop me outright anymore. Although sometimes I have found that the project is really too big and I'm not ready, LOL. Because then I'd have to redo what I couldn't figure out sooner. Yeah, what I always say when someone feels, and I've had to do this too, is if I ever have a story that as I'm doing the world building is getting too big, I will just take one element out of that and then write that. And then all that other stuff I will either use as history for the world or whatever, or something for another book, a side book, a free novella I could add to something later, um, anything like that. But just because a project's really big doesn't mean that you're not capable of writing it. It just means you need to find the part that you can write right now. So take the thing that you're most excited about out of this whole story and just tell that story. And you can drop little hints and clues for things that are coming later because that just makes readers feel like they earn something when they're reading your whole thing. You know what I'm saying? So that's a good comment. Good job. Kidder Raw on Do I Really Make a Chapbook Ever Mount said... Dude, are you in a bookstore or is that just your paperback rack holder? Can't stop looking at it. LOL, I just want to peruse all the books. They look vintage. Yeah, this spinner rack here. Let me see. Can I do this? Yeah, this spinner rack. There, there we go. That's a good shot of it. This I got at a bookstore because they were going to get rid of it or they were going to put it up on Craigslist and sell it, the, just the rack. And um, I'm like, hey, like, I'll buy that. 
And so we were like going back and forth with price and they wanted like a hundred bucks for it. And then I'm like, Hey, how about I give you all the books that I have in the trunk of my car? And it was probably about like 10 grocery bags full of books. And, um, we just traded, I got the rack and they got a bunch of books that I was going to like give to Goodwill. So that worked out. And the books that I keep on it are vintage um, mass market paperbacks because that's the size of the holders in there. Like, I can't put trades in there. Like, um, the things are too small. And I think that's actually why they were getting rid of it because um, the the rack itself is kind of big. And um, when you have a shit ton of trade paperbacks and not a lot of small mass markets. Um, yeah, I can see why they got rid of it, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Like I, I would probably eventually like to get rid of it just because it does take up a lot of space and I'm trying to, um, leave here, but I'm glad you dug it. Um, critical nerd theory on, do I really make a chapbook every month? Oh Yes. You found the video. Thanks for answering my question. I love your output. Thank you. Michael says, what software do you use to lay out your books in? I use Affinity Publisher for my first one and had the uh, had the darndest time figuring out how to do printer layouts versus reader layouts. Okay, so this is in... Michael, if you're watching this, earlier in this video... I was doing um, a series of videos called how to make a chat book or something like that. And one of the videos that I was talking about on here actually was the formatting video. But I basically write my shit in Scrivener, whatever poems I want to use, I, I use a MacBook. So I put them in pages. And when I do that, I make sure to click facing pages. So they're like this in the preview. And that also gives a little gutter. And then you can move the margins and the gutter and all that shit um, if you want. And then when I'm going to like actually print the books out and make the books, I save a PDF out of pages. And then I open that PDF in a program called Create Booklet that costs a couple bucks. I can't remember how much it costs. Um, and then I use create booklet and then that formats the, it puts that PDF into a, um, page turning fucking thing. Um, I don't know a better way of describing that, but I do a better job of it in another video. So hopefully that's helpful for you, man. I wish I could write more quickly. Are you still accepting poems to publish? Um, I am still doing blood rag stuff although i haven't put the new blood rag out yet so that is on i don't know if i'm going to be able to do that monthly just because like i just don't really have the time to sift through stuff but um, i would like to still be putting the blood rag out do a chat book based on prompts that's a question that you were asking um yeah, because I think you're talking about when I do the, like, chat book in an hour thing. Like, I will have a prompt or a theme, but I will write one poem off of that and then find other, like, main ideas or phrases or words in that one big poem and pull a bunch out of there. And then each one of those like words or phrases or whatever becomes the theme or prompt for a different poem, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, hopefully that made sense. Um, Jim. Hey Matt. Very good. Even great video. Oh, awesome. Glad you dug it more than zero with Adam. Chris says, dope. Oh, wait, no, that was on the Bukowski one. This is the one, more than zero, with Adam Crawford. Adam seems like a great dude. I really dug the poem about comparing cats to dogs. Gonna have to check the rest of his work out. 
and that's Michael. And Michael, if you haven't followed him on Instagram yet, I've noticed that he's been posting um, just poems up on Instagram lately. So definitely check him out there. It's I think his handle is I'm the foot. I'm pretty sure that's what his handle is on Instagram. Critical Nerd Theory says, I ordered a chapbook last week from your Etsy store. Does that mean I have to cancel my order? No, because that video that says I finally left Etsy, that was from December. Um, and since then, I have gone back to Etsy. So, look at that. Oh, here's a video. How I make chapbooks using Scrivener Pages, Google Sheets, and Create Booklet. Boom! Right there. Um... And then Critical Nerd Theory says, can you make a video on how you put the printed copies together? I saw your video where you were saying your printer hates cardstock, and I was wondering what's your work around that, and how do you staple them? Okay, I can do a video on that. Let me write that down. I will do a video on that. The workaround with my printer hating cardstock is to put less in the paper tray or only do like no more than 10 at a time. And then, so if I'm making 50 books, I will set the printer five different times to do 10 pieces of cardstock. But knowing that one to two of those are going to get destroyed in my printer so then I have to figure out how many are left and then make that at the very end but um, some card stocks I've used I've had to do print one at a time and like kind of hand feed it into the printer for it to take um, but there there really isn't a workaround if your printer isn't good at printing um, heavier bond uh, card stock, heavier weight card stock. Like you have to just use different paper or use a different, like a thinner stock. There's, um, I don't know why this is, but there's a lot of like stationary, like, um, greeting card shit you could get on like Amazon or stationary stores or, uh, scrapbooking paper that, even though the weight will say it's the same weight as like printer paper, it is way easier and lighter um, than printer paper. I don't know why any of this is the way it is. It's just how it is. You would think a weight would be a standard measurement, but it's not. Um, and it might be weight per ream, but that doesn't even make sense. So I don't know fucking how this shit works. I just know that when I buy paper and stock, it's easier for me to buy it in person than online because I like to touch the paper and feel it and kind of see how malleable it is, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, so that's just me, but I will make a video about this. Um, happy Easter, everybody. Um, is Ocean Vong good? Oh, wait, no. People say Baltimore has an accent, but I don't hear it. Baltimore fucking has an accent. It really does. There are a couple words that when you hear them from someone from Baltimore, you know immediately they're from Baltimore. Oh my God. What is it? I give Shailen shit about it all the time too. Okay, let's see. Is Ocean Vong good? Um, this is from Robert Cunningham. I googled Ocean Vong is bad for poetry, and this video was among the only that seemed to respond to my question. I 100% think that Ocean Vong's work is pretentious, immoderate, unskilled, and cliche. Wow. His language seems indicative of aphasia. I wonder if he had a stroke. No offense to stroke victims. Wow. Oh my God, Robert is mad. Robert's pissed. Fills me to the core like a skeleton. Question mark. What? How is the center like the supportive structure? Why is a raven 
like a writing desk. The mind boggles chasing the rabbit of his affected verse. In the body where everything has a price sounds heavy and deep, but is utterly banal and easily parodied. In the airport where everything has a price, etc. And what makes the cost of the body to peeping in on this imagined singer very creepily there is none this poem makes a claim and then cannot even focus long enough to build it artfully into a and a kind of real emotional payoff vong's recourse to sexual sub dom dichotomy is typical and meant, I think, to signal how queer he is. Original! Except he's ripping off every last queer poet since queers put Quill to page. The whole thing is a mess. I flash back to participating in some gross Halloween game in which a bowl of pumpkin guts got passed around and the participants blindfolded are told to feel witches' intestines. I feel ick. Okay, um, I haven't even read the rest of this, but what this screams of, and I don't know Robert, but this screams of middle-aged, straight, white, angry poet that is mad that they know everything about poetry and yet have never been successful in poetry. I see a lot of this from a lot of people like I just described. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to worship Ocean Vong. I'm not saying that at fucking all. If you don't like Ocean Vong, you don't like Ocean Vong. And that's fine. But every, like nitpick that go that when people nitpick ocean vong and go after him i feel like the nits that are being picked are so fucking ridiculous that you could do this with any fucking poet in the world okay and then like saying like oh yeah like writing queer stuff about like the whole sub dob dichotomy like that's so cliche because queers have been doing that forever Straight people have been doing that forever, too. Writing love poems and sex poems, like man-on-woman sex. Maybe that poem about being queer isn't for you if you are a straight man. If you have not said to yourself, man, all these love poems, this is getting really cliche and stupid. If you've never said that, then what you're doing right now is attacking a community for not pandering to you. And that is the fucking problem. That you think that everything should be written for you. I'm getting a little fucking mad right now, okay? Not everything has to be written for you. Like, it just doesn't. You go into great detail about how bad you think each of his lines are. Some people like them, some people don't. Some people like me kind of just don't give a shit. If you like something, like it. And if you do like something and you like it, have a good reason to like it, okay? If you don't like something, that's fine too. But when people sit here and bitch like this, it's like, then fucking do better. Instead of fucking writing a fucking goddamn thesis on how awful you think someone's poetry is, why don't you shut the fuck up and just write a better poem and put it out? And if it's as good as you say it is, people should just love it. But the problem is a lot of times when people like this talk shit like this and then put that perfect poem out, people don't like it. Why is that? How could that even be? Hmm. Shit. Does that mean art is not objective? I guess so. That means art is fucking subjective. And people have fucking tastes. 
And they don't have to like your perfectly structured fucking posy. If you cannot build an audience or get the grants or do the thing, even though your poetry is perfect, then what the fuck is going on? And how can you have any fucking judgment on anyone else's work? Um, since there was a sort of compliment to my channel, or at least that video, um, I'm going to read the rest of your comment now. And let's hope uh, I don't get mad. Anywho, yeah, I'm right there with you, anywho. I think you have true respect for poetry as an art form and agree wholeheartedly with you that the job of the poet is to connect on an emotional level with the reader slash listener. Perhaps if poets had taken better care to fulfill this contract, a careless po-taster? Oh, poet Aster? I don't know what that means. Like Ocean Vong would not be so popular. However, I also think the poet should challenge the reader and listener. I want to think as well as feel when I'm experiencing a poem. Let the poet open my heart like a kindly surgeon, and then when I'm helpless to protect, whisper something strange into my ear. Hope that's not too weird. Thanks for the video. Yeah, and honestly, I kind of wish I read the rest of that before I fucking took you to task. But I still think there are some issues here. Um, who fucking cares that Ocean Vong is popular? How does Ocean Vong being popular hurt anyone? Like, what does it do to you? Like, what have you experienced negatively that Ocean Vong is popular? Like, I just, I don't understand why people are angry that Ocean Vong is popular. Like, it's the same thing, like, like trans people. Like, if you're not trans and you're not, like, dating trans people or you are not, like, have close family members who are trans and there are no trans people in your life, what the fuck does it matter to you if someone is trans? What does that have to do with anything that's going to happen in your life? Nothing. So Ocean Vong is a famous poet. People like Ocean Vong. What the fuck does that have anything to do? How does that affect your daily life? I just don't understand. I just don't fucking get it. Um, T.S. Eliot ruined the world, you know, and I'm kind of mad at him, but like I, I have other things to do as well. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and you, you guys have heard me bitch about T.S. Eliot, so I'm not going to fucking beat that dead horse. But um, I don't think Ocean Vong has done anything to not fulfill his contract. Um, no artist has any fucking like obligation to make everyone happy. That's a fucking stupid fucking thing to think. So like, uh, I don't even know how to fucking not get super fucking pissed off right now. Um, the idea that ocean Vong is famous and has lots of fans means that he is doing exactly what he should be doing. And the only thing any artist, poets included, should ever be doing is getting the work out of their body, however that comes out. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's indifferent, whether anyone will ever fucking read it. Our jobs is not to fucking please Robert Cunningham, our job is to write a fucking poem. And yes, you want a poem that um, like rips your heart open and then whispers something in your ear when you're vulnerable. 
that is a perfectly reasonable thing to want as a reader but that is a ridiculous thing to expect every fucking poet on the planet who has ever lived or will live to fucking do that for you like Every poet is not for you. But the fact that you like that means search that shit out. When you find somebody like Ocean Vong, who you obviously had to Google because you had the time to do so, when you find somebody that you like, read those people. When you find someone you don't like, fucking move on. There's only so many fucking hours in the day. Like, I just don't get it. I just don't fucking get it. I don't know. Like, I appreciate you taking the time to leave this comment. I hope you're not fucking livid that I said what I said. But a lot of this stuff, like, I really feel like there is a group of middle-aged, straight, white dudes who are educated, who fucking think that they live in this vacuum where everyone is going to just agree with them because, you know, they're middle-aged straight white dudes that have an education. So, of course, you have to fucking agree with me. Ha! Ah, this is dribble. Everyone agree with me. I have a piece of paper that I paid a lot of money for that says I'm fucking smart. You know, whatever. Who gives a shit? I just don't understand why people think that they need to fucking do this. Just like what you like and fuck off. It's not that fucking hard, but I appreciate that you think I like art because I do. Um, and I'm glad you enjoyed the video at least because I, I actually liked making that video. And I came in thinking that I was going to absolutely hate Ocean Bong. And I kind of came out feeling like, oh, that was actually kind of good. Um, I'm not going out and buying his books, but I was not horribly offended by what I fucking saw in that video. Jesus. Can't believe I'm still talking. Um, Chasey says, stop stealing drinks, Matt. Oh, it's 1727. Did I steal a drink? Or is it, oh yeah, yeah, cause I ran up cause like we were in this like desert, we were at, on the beach bit and there was nowhere to get a drink. And then suddenly there were these two chicks like with drinks and they looked kind of cool. And so, um, we were like, whoa, 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 where'd you get that? Yeah. So that did happen. Um, Haas says, yay. So proud of you, Adam. I wonder if that's who did the editing on his stuff. Oh my gosh, I can't even breathe. Um, Jeff says, we have a few casinos in Massachusetts. I work at the one near me. We don't have machines at convenience stores other than the lottery, though just in the casino. We used to have a horse track and a dog track near me when I was younger, but they faded and are gone now. I think they might be outlawed, but I'm not 100% sure. Oh, we were talking about gambling and stuff on that live stream. Um, Got to get your mangoes. Fuck, yes, you do. I see tattoo ink. What tattoos do you have? Oh, my God. Should I do a video on my tattoos? I have... Um, I stopped counting at 20. So, maybe I could count again and find out. But, um, okay tattoos we'll put that on the list of things to do a video about should do a listing of members poetry rehearsed i don't know what that means be can you be more specific with that um and this is on the midlife crisis with matthew buckley smith um, this episode was great. I really enjoyed Matthew's takes on things. Can't wait to pick up his book. Oh, totally do it. And let him know when you do. Um, I think the Lord is risen is grammatically correct. Okay. It just sounds strange to me. Maybe it's not strange. I don't know. Um, Tempest says on the uh, Bombay Beach Benali video... This is fancy as all heck. Fireworks at a literature event. 
I thought this stuff was meant to be demure and no fun. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's why I was so shocked when I got there. And I was like, what the fuck is happening right now? Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, bookscapades. I love the IG live idea about the me pulling books out and like reading them on lives yeah i i almost started doing that the other day so i might as well start um adam and this is from books of page two that's shaylin by the way guys um adam you're such a sweetheart thanks for the shout out at the end such an episode love your work my friend uh on the zine culture episode carol says i hope mine was in the first 20. Oh, yeah, because uh, the first yours was. But I think you got it already. Um, NJ says, I love your vibe. Oh, well, you should see my dildo. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But NJ, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Making chat books and packaging orders. Carol said, misheard lyrics is one of my favorite things and the bad lip reading vids. They're always a good time. That's a chat book right there. Misheard lyrics. And then the next one, bad lip reading. Do it. I like it. I want you to do that, Carol. Bookish says, oh, this is on the beware of me. The response to Bookish's video. I was just reacting to the idea that some seem to have that certain word count equals a completed book. Yeah. And he did say that like that. And I should have hit that. What you said is on the money though. And you covered a lot of points I had not considered. Almost all the crappy poems I write, I write on my phone out in the world somewhere. It keeps me from forgetting my inspiration. That is so good. Yeah, I do that too. I at least try... Uh, I hate when I do this. I at least try to write down um, my ideas like that. So, for real. Great example of thrifty writing. Glad I'm not the only one with a wiener abdomen problem. <laughs> you know what's funny? I don't remember why I said it, but I remember saying it. And I remember when I said it, I was like... Huh. I wonder if there was something else I could have said there. Um, I don't think there is a right way to go with draft or beta readers. For me, I need those extra drafts to do all the things I want to do. Knowing I can correct my drafts helps me keep going on the first draft. Yeah, because I hate, like, no one should ever edit anything during their first draft. Just type until you're done. Don't look back. Don't read other sentences. Don't read the paragraph before. Type until you're done. Seriously. Like, your finished book will thank you for that. Let's see. For me... Oh, yeah, yeah. We just read that. Um, if I felt like I had to get it exactly right the first time, it would put too much pressure on me, and I probably wouldn't ever finish the first. I think that's the thing though. Like I don't think that I have to get it exactly right the first time. I just assume that I'm going to because I know how to do what I know how to do. And I know that's going to be the best book I could write at that moment. So I think if you put the pressure, like you have to get it right this time, that would be a lot of pressure and that would be painful. So I think just if you say to yourself, self, I know how to do this, so let's just kick some ass right now and we'll, like, we'll touch base later, you know, that, that might help you a little bit. Of course I didn't include you in the writers. <laughs> I was just trying to sell your stuff group. Sell you stuff group. Sell you stuff group. Hmm. That's why I listed you in the show notes as a writer who's writing content you could trust. I love your writing advice and trust its sincerity, even when I don't agree with it. Ah, oh, thank you so much for that. That's amazing. I appreciate that. 
And that, again, that's a really great video, guys. Go watch Brian's video on that. Totally agree with reading your work out loud, especially the poetry. Yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone on the fucking planet thinks reading your work out loud is a better way to edit than just reading it on a computer screen. And honestly, reading it on in print is even better than reading it on a computer screen. And I don't know why that is. But you will find more mistakes reading it in print than on computer. And you will find more mistakes than reading it out loud than reading it in print. Um, regarding first drafts, you should look up Dean Wesley Smith and his technique for banging tons of novels in a first draft. I have no idea what that is. I am going to look that up because that that would be nice if I had some backup on that theory. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, Gareth! This is brilliant. I love Brian's video, too. I never had the computer read my work back to me, but I'm going to try it. It sounds like a great way for picking up silly mistakes it totally is punctuation is kind of weird on that but the words you'll be able to get some stuff out of i'm in the middle of a short story collection I have a bunch of ideas and i am following them through to see how it goes loving the challenge though and really like the material that's coming out of it thanks for doing these videos of advice well thank you for watching them you're awesome how do you figure out your word count um, most writing software, and this is from Steven, most writing software has um, a word count in it. And I think even a lot of email um, things do. So even if like your notepad doesn't do word count, if you copy whatever you just wrote on your notepad on your phone and then put it in an email, I think the email will tell you on most email platforms how many words it is. But like Scrivener does it, you can find it on uh, Microsoft Word. And if you can't, I think if you go to format, I think it's under format on the top. I haven't used Microsoft Word in fucking forever. But um, it'll just do the scroll downs until you find word count and it'll tell you what your word count is. I want you two favorites of mine to collab on a video. I'm down. I track my progress to know where I am at. I either time myself or do a word count every night, but I always give myself grace because life. Great advice, buddy. MJ, P.S. I'm writing as I'm listening to you. Oh, that's good. I want you two favorites of mine to collab on a video. Are you talking about me and Bookish? Yeah, I'll do a video of Bookish anytime. Anytime. And um, I wonder what you were writing when you were listening. Or were you writing this as you were listening? Either way. That's interesting. Okay. Oh my gosh, I think we got to the end of the thing here. <sighs> Let's see. This is from Goth and Whimsy. Goth and Whimsy. And that is, I think that's Nikki Nikki Jam. And this says, reminds me of that saying, if you want to be a writer, write. There's a reason so many of the greats were hermits. I feel like social media and the pressure to have the right online presence has turned the writing aesthetic into a high priority rather than the production of art itself. I see so many videos of people setting up writing spaces, so many writing playlists and writing outfit ideas being shared. I don't see these people producing work, which leads me to ask, what the fuck does that stuff matter? If it helps you, great. But I see so many writers, myself included, getting trapped into this weird cycle of prepping without doing. The moment I shut that shit out and throw out the pressure to write a certain amount of day, week, or month, the words flow. Well, here is what I'll say. And I think this is pretty legit shit. I think social, social, social media has um, destroyed as many writers as it has created. 
in the sense that a lot of people who would have written books never tried because they were able to reach a wider audience by just tweeting than they ever would have been able to reach like trying to publish a book. And for a lot of people, I think um, that's enough for them. And so like, yeah, I would like to write a book, but you know what? I'm really digging putting my hot takes up on social media or coming up with ideas for my Instagram or figuring out content for my YouTube videos and all this other shit. Um, I am a strong believer that if Bukowski had like Twitter, um, he never would have ever attempted to write a book. Um, so that's just like one example. I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of us too, who spend a lot of time on social media, if we were alive 50 or 60 years ago in our prime, um, we would have been like putting books out all the time instead of being on social media. So I don't know. I think it's a toss up. Um, but I just realized that I spent a lot of time on social media and I put out a lot of stuff. So I don't know what the fuck I would have done. I don't know what I would have done now that I think about it. But I think um, th there's a lot to be said there. So um, this video is long, so I'm going to wrap it up. But thank you all for your comments. And um, I will try to do these every week and um, make sure I get these out and up. Okay. So leave comments down below and I'm going to respond to everybody now. And um, hopefully you remember that you even left me a comment in the first place. Okay. Type right, everybody. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.